All right, and we are live. Welcome to Beastly Thoughts Live Podcast, the number one source for a video game-related discussion on the internet, as judged by Robbie's mom. Recorded live on <laughs> Twitch.tv, Briar Rabbit, every Sunday evening, and broadcast throughout the world via YouTube, iTunes, and Podbean. Today we'll be taking a look at the latest news in video games, as well as discussing how early a game should be announced, and much more. So... That being said, I want to hear from you guys. What the fuck you been up to? What have you oh, been yeah. doing all week? I know what you've been doing, Gary. You've been up to straight cold, stone cold murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been the chump getting murdered more than anything else. I've, I seem to have hit an early sort of peak crescendo in my skill in PUBG, and it's just tailed off now to just a, a whimpering mess of, of jelly. Yeah. It's pretty awful. I find, Gary, is that I go on streaks where, like, I'll jump in and I'll get ten games in a row where I'll murder like two or three people like right off the bat. You know, if I assuming I jump into like a busy place and I'm doing well and I'm getting loot and you know each of those games I'll just keep going and doing well, right? I don't necessarily win each one. I don't win any of them, but you know I'll, I'll go top oh. ten for like you know five games in a row, and then I'll hit a roadblock where all of a sudden I jump in. The first guy I see murders me right off the bat. And it's like five games in a row of that, and I'm just like, fuck this game, I hate this game. <laughs> <laughs> I've had those moments, so for me, it's I, I get itchy, itchy feet. I've got this kind of desire to move and push at all times. And I just, mm-hmm. I, I, I managed to win my first encounters, I get all my loot, um, and then just the, the, the itchy feet in, in Battlegrounds, I just push straight to the middle of the circle and shot from about three kilometers away by someone in the middle of a field and, and that's the end of my spree yeah uh, and then i say i'm not going to do it again and next next map instantly do it again shot and uh yeah it's, it's uh, you gotta always be moving you gotta can't can't sit still like camping in a room like you see so many players do ultimately i think that probably is a more successful strategy is just sitting in a room waiting for everybody else to kill each other but man it's boring i can't do it either yeah I mean, in terms of what I've been playing, PUBG is one of my addictions that I'm trying to cut. It's, it's kind of like smoking or crack, um, something, you know. That you... Cut that crack, Gary. Exactly. You know you shouldn't be doing, but damn, is it Moorish, you know? It's it's one of those things, crack, not uh, not PUBG. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's, I don't know, for me, it's one of those games that I, I know I'm going to have a long uh, and healthy relationship with, or maybe an unhealthy relationship with, but it's not something that I've been sinking a huge amount of time into maybe sort of two three hours a night and um, what i did play last week was dark souls 3 um, i actually finished that game and that was something that i'd spoke about the week before mm-hmm. um went through finished the game off first time i've ever completed a Soulsborne game really enjoyed it got me in the mood for for playing more of them um and at the moment i'm i'm kind of at the mercy of of uh viewer comments here to say whether or not i should dip my feet into bloodborne um, oh, or whether or not, yes, yeah. So absolutely. Blood, people tell me to pick up, or whether or not I should look at Neo, um, which are the two that that people tell me are, are great games and something you should pick mm-hmm. up after Dark Souls Three. So that will be on my playlist. And the the kind of I guess wild card that I've picked up this week and, uh, and completed in seven hours, which was a bit of a disappointment, but also nice to have a game that's just one and done in seven hours, was Gears of War Four for the oh, PC. Yeah. yeah so. I played um, Gears, I bought it on the Xbox Play Anywhere, and didn't like it on controller at all. Um, picked up keyboard and mouse and suddenly felt like the aim was a lot tighter. It just Really? Mm. I don't know if the aim assist is bad in that game or something else, or I've just got silly thumbs when it comes to holding joysticks, but have any of you guys played Gears 4? Am I just late to the party? No, I haven't actually. I'd love to try it though, because Gears of War was a great series, but just haven't had a chance to play it. Yeah, I really enjoyed the original three games, um, but you know, there's. It, I felt like after I played those games in in the years since that, all right, I've had my Gears of War fix. There's, unless they do something radically different, there's not much that's really going to attract me to that game, and that doesn't doesn't seem like that's what they did with this new game is anything radically yeah. different. Yeah, I agree. So I played it through because I got it super super cheap. I mean, it was like I got a CD key for it, and you you meant to. I think it's sixty dollars still digital uh, if you want to play it on pc because you have to buy it through the windows store Mm -hmm. Uh, and i found like a third party cd key for like ten dollars which was like crazy cheap so i thought really play it wow 
Yeah, and you, you're completely right there, um, Briar. It, it doesn't do anything new. It feels like a game that's 10 years old, maybe, in terms of the way it's portrayed. Um, mm-hmm. It's got stupid, dumb chase scenes. It's got cheesy dialogue. Um, it's move forward and trigger an enemy wave event, kill the wave, move forward, or stand in one point whilst enemy waves spawn on you. Um, but it, it's got something, I guess, that the other gear stories didn't have, and that's a poignant father-son campaign. Mm-hmm. Um no spoilers into it, not going to go in, but you know that you, your main protagonist is J.D. Phoenix, which is Marcus Phoenix's son. Uh, and to me, it was nice to have that vested interest in that I know Marcus's story. Um, and I also you know, know the man that he was and the man that he now is, seeing what that was. So what kept me playing it was the narrative. I think the narrative was strong. If it hadn't been as strong a story, I'd have put it down after an hour. But Mm. I just about went through seven, eight hours to finish the campaign. Um, I'd say if you can pick it up for ten dollars, it's worth it if you enjoy a storyline. But nothing new in the gameplay at all. No, um, gotcha. that's been my my week. Um, pass the baton over to to Robbie, I guess. Robbie, what you been up to? Absolutely. Uh, just before we get into that, I actually want to address that. Uh, unfortunately, Beasley could not be here with us today. He and his wife. His wife specifically had a bit all of right, a medical. We don't need to share their personal details. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to say, okay. basically, his wife is sick and he's taking care of her. That's all I was really going to say. <laughs> but just to Yeah, sure. <laughs> we love Beastly and we wish him well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Actually, we fired him. <laughs> he's out. I don't you know what we're going to do with the nice branding about... of the show now. It's really kind of awkward. Might as well bluntly yeah. tell it. He's fired. Yeah, fuck well, him. You know what? We don't need him. <laughs> we've slowly become a podcast for the PC Master Race, and after seeing him use keyboard and mouse, we just thought, we, we can't be having hosts on here it, like that. The last show I was when Gary Just's found out pony. he was using yeah. a Sony PlayStation controller to play PUBG. That was it. Gary just I think that blew his yeah. lid. <laughs> That's when we had to kick him off. It's like, you know what? Just get out of here. We're done with you. <laughs> Just the thought show. That's right. <laughs> this is now the podcast formerly known as Beastly Thoughts Live. We're, we're uh, looking for name suggestions moving forward. Yeah, Beastly we'll Thoughts without Beastly. Beastly. Prince style. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to... Thoughts, thoughts Live. That's it. We're just thinking. <laughs> thoughts Live. There you go. It's a new name. Uh, anyways, I've been playing, yeah, some PUBG this week as well, because that game is amazing. It really is, I think, one of the best early access games I've ever played. Just, they're supporting it really well. We've all had a blast playing it together. Uh, can't wait to play more of it with you guys and with other people and just whoever's down. Another game I've been playing also on PC, because PC is my new addiction, is a game that I'd always wanted to try that I've actually bought like three, four years ago. Never started it. Spec Ops The Line. Heard awesome things about that game. Finally jumped into this week, and it's a really, really fun third-person shooter, just cover-based. Um, I mean, the story's pretty basic. You know, you're a U.S. military group. You're in Dubai and sort of infiltrating these terrorists, but it's got these cool story elements to it, and it's a lot of fun on PC. Like, it's just really fun to play, and I'm really enjoying it a lot. So that's been about it for me, but yeah, uh, the, been having a blast. I remember that game coming out. Uh, and it got a lot of press for the story and where the story went. Yeah, the campaign's cool. Yeah, you enjoying that? I'll be interested once you finish it because it it got a lot of press for the story. Yeah. It was kind of like the 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 headlines for that game were mediocre video game, pretty spectacular story. <laughs> That's a common theme this week. Same with the uh, gears. I think you've summarized yeah. that too. Yeah. Um, I've also been playing PUBG. You guys have seen that on the channel. Uh, I've found that the game is uh, it's grabbing me really tightly by the short and curlies and won't let go. <laughs> really good to know. I, I haven't had a game <laughs> kind of c- catch me in uh, in such a way in a long time, and I'm really enjoying my time with it. It's fun to play solo. It's fun to play with teammates. Like I really am enjoying it. So... That's really all I've been playing, though. I haven't played anything new. Oh, I played Friday the 13th, and I really actually enjoy Friday the 13th. Have you guys checked that out yet? No, I haven't had a chance I've, to play it. it I've looks watched super um, a lot of streamers play it. I think it's, yeah. it's another game that is is really great to stream. I don't know if it's got the longevity to play on your own, but definitely as a streamer, I could see why why you've got the appeal. And your DCP streamers, fantastic. I mean, That we, was a we lot of the, fun. We saw the real murderer in you, Briar, come out there when you... <laughs> 
<laughs> you stood up and axed Watts in the face. That was pretty savage, I must say. Oh my god, that was so funny. <laughs> yeah. um, so, my like, kind of my views on this game is if you got a bunch of friends that are interested in playing it together, then it's absolutely go pick it up. But yeah. for I th- what does it cost? Forty dollars right now. It it feels kind of like an early access game, to be honest with you. Last weekend, the servers were up and down all weekend. I think they've straightened that out somewhat over the week. Um, they're still talking about releasing a campaign that's not out yet. Uh, so it's just kind of this single player or this multiplayer stuff. And um, it's definitely fun multiplayer. But to me, it's really fun to play with friends, right? It's like having that interaction and, you know, playing with your friends in this game is really what it's all about. Uh, so it's a little hard for me to recommend to anybody. But. You know, it's at least worth checking out, especially if you have a group of friends that play regularly, uh, because it, it, the mechanics all work well enough that it doesn't get in the way of, you know, being Jason and killing camp counselors who are your friends, or being the camp counselor and trying to escape Jason. And the mechanics are pretty smart, the way that Jason has a lot more mobil- mobility in the way his powers work, but he actually walks pretty slow. Where the camp counselors can run fast, but they have a limited amount of stamina. And once that's up, they're all but useless. And they can strike yeah. back at Jason. They can knock him down uh, to try and get away. But that's only successful sometimes. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the mileage massively varies based on the people that you'll match with in your lobby. As you said, if you've got friends, then it's it's great. But, I mean, I've watched a lot of streamers do it. And... When you get a good Jason, a guy who's role-playing it hard, um, I think one of the features that, that it has, if I'm not mistaken, is proximity chat. Is that right? Yeah. That you can hear other people. So when you've got a guy role-playing Jason really well, you know, and chasing people and speaking with a high-pitched German accent, it's it's really, really <laughs> great. And it, it adds a lot to the story. Um, you know, and, and I guess that if you've got a lobby where the people are just mouth breathing down their microphones and there's not that that immersion factor then you know, i think you're going to lose interest pretty quick but yeah definitely i think it's one of those games that the mileage will vary based yeah. on who you're playing it with yeah i was going to say uh, with PUBG, um briar you you mentioned there's a game that's, that's grabbed you uh, i guess in a way that destiny did longevity wise what do you think that PUBG needs to do going into release to keep you playing in three six twelve months time um, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a game that I play for like a year straight, right? I think I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm very addicted to it right now. Uh, as they, maybe as the summer goes on, I expect that that intense relationship will die out a little bit. It'll become a more kind of like, you know, once every couple of days or once a week kind of game. Uh, part of why I'm so addicted to it is that I am mentally preparing myself for Destiny 2 coming out on PC. I want to get used to keyboard and mouse controls a little bit. So this is a perfect opportunity to just kind of uh, re-familiar my, refamiliarize myself with the PC controls. Um, but I can't, unless they add, I suppose if they add more maps, maybe if they added some more game modes, maybe like smaller maps with fewer people on it. Wilson was saying that last time we were playing. Uh, you had a great suggestion with a very urban map that I thought was a really good idea. Uh, I think uh, you know a map that's a big change in that way, whereas your suggestion, Gary, was a map that is one enormous city, right? And you come in, yeah. and then it's it's going to be all CQC battles, right? It's going to be all close quarters battles. I thought I thought that was really interesting. There could be still streets that you're driving down to get from place yeah. to place, but it, you know, it's just a it's a big city. That I, that kind of idea changes the gameplay up enough, I think, that it would still be interesting. But you know, if it's still one map with all the same weapons, one game mode, one type of mode that you play, eventually, you know, over the course of summer, I would imagine I get a little more bored with it. Uh, and as you know, Destiny Two kind of creeps its its ugly little head up with a beta, and then with the full release, you know, my my attention will come back to Destiny. Also. Looking at Destiny 2 coming out and thinking, you know, it's a good time for me to step away from Destiny for a little bit. You know, relax. Yeah. Give myself a, like a kind of a break from Destiny. That way I come into it with fresh eyes for the beta. So I've got that kind of mentality a little bit as well. Sounds awesome. For me, the, the only thing that would keep me playing it is Conan Exile's penis physics. I mean, that's that's really the, 
the main thing that I think that game needs is big floppy schlongs. Where, where's the dick physics in Destiny? Yeah, what the hell, Bungie? All games could be. What did I pay for? <laughs> yeah, no, really no floppy mean. dicks. <laughs> I'm hoping that's what the PC delay is. You know, the reason the PC's coming out later is they're just having real trouble with the dick slider. That's, that's the real, <laughs> like we can't figure this the out. One we need more time. Yeah, we're gonna delay this feature. game until we get our dick the physics dick physics correct. engine just doesn't work as well on a on the on the Radeon graphics card. So they really have to. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> AMD. They're having issues with. Rumor has it when Luke Smith said that you can't play the game at 60 FPS because of the complex physics engine. That's, <laughs> that's specifically why. what he's referring to. There you to. go. That's the important detail. The, the penis is holding us at 30 FPS. That's that's the issue. <laughs> you could say the penis is worth, holding us back. Worth. Totally worth. <laughs> <laughs> worries there's one other game that i wanted to mention actually this week mainly for the reason that i wanted to have a little bit of a moan about it and that's is it rising storm 2 vietnam is it rising thunder rising storm rising one storm yeah yeah rising came storm. Out on steam so um and un, i'm not going to name and shame them but one of the uh, the fans or viewers of, of the show actually recommended that i pick this up and i found it very cheaply i think it was like eight dollars it wasn't a lot of money mm -hmm. um god fuck that game man that is a, it's Ooh. so bad Wow. Really, really bad. It could just be that I'm awful at it, um, but it felt more early access than a, than an early access game at full release, the fact they're charging for it. There was really very, very little. It felt like um, if you mixed PUBG's hit detection with Battlefield 1's open maps in Vietnam, um, with just screaming I... abusive people in the team chats, like it was, it was toxic. I played it for about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I should probably have done my Steam refund, but stupidly I didn't now, and it's it's, it's gone on there. But uh, yeah, I mean, have you guys seen anything to do with that game? Cause no, I haven't heard of this. No, I've heard of it, but yeah, I didn't really know too much Is about it, it. So it's like a battlefield game set in world, in in Vietnam. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, I th I thought of Battlefield Vietnam, so I thought it was going to be a return to to that kind of game, which I really enjoyed, uh, and it was yeah. really cool. So yeah, it's one of those. Um, Plays like Battlefield, you join a squad, you have a limited amount of resources, you're either the uh, the offensive team or the defensive team, or you're capturing, you know, A, B, C, D point on the map. Uh, and it's Viet Cong versus the American troops with, you know, some helicopter gameplay and other things there. But it's gone for, like, hyper-realism. Um, you know, the guns handle in the way that an AK would and other things like that, mm -hmm. which sounds great, but is incredibly unsatisfying to play. One of the reasons that Destiny is so satisfying is that the gameplay is nothing like real gunplay. You know, you got sticky, godlike aim. Um, it's so arcadey though, and so fun. Yeah, yeah, but it feels fun to play. You know, and, and Battlefield One is not a military sim. You know, I'm playing World War One, but it it feels you know, nice and, and enjoyable to play. Yeah, that game was a chore, like a real chore. Um, I'd recommend maybe catching a stream of it if you can, but it looks bad. I was playing it 4K Ultra, and it looked like an early access game. It was horrible. Ew. Really bad. <laughs> wow. And I don't often get on and put a game on blast, but I really didn't enjoy it. There was nothing that I gleaned in that that was fun. The, the soundtrack, actually, give it that. It had some good Vietnam sounds, you know, uh, authentic sounds to it. And you could change the film grain to be like um, an Apocalypse Now style, you know, washed out film grain to it. But yep. yeah, if I can steer one person who watches this away from purchasing it, then it's been a <laughs> successful podcast. Hey, as I long as you have fortunate son playing in the background, you know, <clears throat> Vietnam game. I, as a side thought, I hate film grain in video games. It almost always drives me crazy. I do too. It looks so bad usually. It's like, <laughs> why did you do this? Yeah, yeah, it looks weird to me too. I don't like it. I can't. I can't remember a single time. Maybe actually. No, no, no. I can't think of a single time. But I said, <laughs> man, on. this film grain really no, sets no. this game apart from. <laughs> you remember when Destiny had it yeah. for free for about two months? Oh man, it was like it way was overdone bad. for a while there. Yeah. Yeah. They just they like added it as like a, a stealth patch, and then for two months you had like film grain. It just yeah. couldn't get. I rid remember of it. one day I turned the game on. I don't even remember them like talking about it or knowing it was coming, and I'm just like, "What the hell? Why does the game look so weird?" Yeah, yeah. it was strange. It was the worst. It was the worst. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. should we start up with... Do we want to do the topic of the news first? I forgot. Let's do some news. You guys down? Go that way. Start All right, with some news. It. All right. Nintendo Switch Online membership pricing and more details have been revealed this week. 
online play will remain free until some point in 2018, because, of course, it has been delayed now from fall 2017, at which time Nintendo will be offering memberships in the following intervals and price points. So one month will set you back four US dollars. You can get three months of Nintendo's service for eight dollars, and then an entire year will set you back twenty dollars. By comparison, Xbox Live Gold and PlayStation Plus are three times that, sixty dollars a year. It seems like a really good value to me. Uh, I don't know. Uh, is the community like up in arms about this, or are people generally happy? Because seems to me you're going to get some free old games that. Everybody wants to be playing on the And Switch. now we get to like keep Super them, too. Mario. Yeah, Super Mario Brothers 3. You have uh, Balloon Fight, Dr. Mario. Like, those are the yep. ones that were shown off, right? Yeah. And then these, this is really cheap. $20 for the year. $20 that's kind a year of, is nothing. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of like one of those purchases I make and then forget about until it comes up next year, you know? Right. So yeah. there's a couple of points, I guess, to caveat that and, and something that kind of may well temper the, the, the positivity around it. Whilst it is only $20, you've got to remember that the Nintendo Online offering is not the same as you get with Xbox and PlayStation. That's so the, the thing, too. Are they making it cheaper because it's not as good and they know that? That's why I, what I'm also thinking, too. So online voice chat will only work with friends in your fire team. There won't be open voice chat with anyone that's Yeah, not but it's really cool because you, you can buy this adapter and you plug it into your phone. Well, if okay, you have an iPhone, then you got to get another adapter to plug into yeah. that. And then... <laughs> Then you plug in your headset, and the headset is super cool, too. And it's only, like, what, $30, $40? So really, really cool stuff there. Yeah, we'll dig into that one on the next segment. <laughs> we got story that segment. next, too. <laughs> the, the other issue that you've got is, is people don't know if this Nintendo Classic game selection that they're talking about, you know, it's, it's great that it's replacing the, hey, we give you one game and we'll take it away at the end of the month. Right, yeah, now but you get to keep it forever, pretty much, as long as you're paying. There's a concern that this may be in lieu of a virtual console because they said they're adding SNES game or SNES for you American Yeah, I'm a little concerned about that too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if this is instead of a virtual console, you pay and you get access to them, NES and SNES games, then it's, it's not the virtual console that everyone wanted. So I think E3 will be telling to know whether or not this is a great value proposition or one that's kind of like a bit of a poison pill that takes away our, you know, the virtual console that the Switch needs. I'm I'm surprised if a virtual console isn't out yet. I hope they say something about that at E3 this year because I I'm very interested in, in getting some games for the Switch from that virtual console. Especially, we heard that the GameCube or yeah, the GameCube is coming to it, right? No confirmation of that. No the confirmation GameCube, about that? GameCube GameCube has though. been emulated on the X1 Tegra chip, which is the chip uh, your system on a chip that makes up the Switch. So people have then, you know, supposed that potentially it has the capability to emulate GameCube at 30 frames per second. But that's that not confirmed nice. in any way. But yeah, I, I like the virtual console. It's a, it's a huge ripoff all the time because I buy games and they're stuck on the, on the console that that version of the virtual console is running on, which I hate. I wish it would just come forward. Right. Um, but, I mean, this pricing, it's so cheap. It's literally like, it's forget about it money, you know? Yeah, even if... It's not quite up to the level of PS Plus and Xbox Live. At least people know they're getting classic games they're probably going to really like, and it's just so much cheaper. Like it really, you can't get too mad about this just because yeah. I think the price is perfect. If you think about it, it for really four dollars a month, like if they put out a good, like a good old video game that you want to check out, you could buy it for the month, play a couple of games on the Switch, yeah. you know, and then just let it expire at the end of the month. In fact, that might be the smartest way to go because. I'm not a big fan of the online games that Nintendo has been showing off. Like Splatoon is really interesting, really fun, but it doesn't it doesn't hold my attention for very long. Arms, same kind of thing. I'm, I haven't even played it. There was a kind of a arms test beta thing last month that I didn't even check out. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm not really interested in doing any online gaming on my Switch. So really, the the thing that attracts me is you know first party titles and. Uh, old games like virtual console type games and you know for twenty dollars a year i'm just gonna do it you know yep. yeah no, i hear you i mean it's, it is embarrassing that the virtual console is not out when square enix at least in japan have released the secrets of mana series which are mm -hmm. the game boy color and game boy advance ports you right. can get so if you've got the the japanese account on your console now you can pick them up which are like a virtual console released as a game at least for that series that's cool. And the fact that a third party's done it before Nintendo is a bit, yeah, a bit of a letdown. But 
at least SNK it's out. has <laughs> been or SNK has been releasing a lot of Neo Geo games for it too. That too. Yeah. And, I mean, they're just printing money with that. Yeah, they are. It's really smart what they're doing. I've noticed that too. As opposed to Capcom that put out a new version of Street Fighter 2 for 40 freaking dollars. $40 Ooh. for like a 20 year old game. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And, and that game <laughs> is really good, except for the Switch exclusive parts. So that the, the yeah, you know, was it H- Hadouken? <laughs> oh, it's awful. Like, you know, you, you can, can use the motion controllers to like pretend to be. I can't. Re- I don't know if it's real or Ken, but you you can like do spinning kicks and you can do like the fireball. Oh, that is so dumb. Oh, but it man. works really shitty and it looks really shitty. <laughs> Talking about so shitty dumb. motion controls and you didn't check out the global test punch. I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Arms. Great game. Um, really yeah. interesting. That does look like a. It will be a fun fighter to pick up. The motion control aspect that they've said is like the unique selling point of it. Yeah. is the most uncomfortable, unresponsive, awful way of playing the game. Wow. Pro no. controller, it works well. Yeah, it's it's not good. I could see it being fun at a party. In news that two- shocks nobody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, <exactly. laughs> um yeah, it, it wasn't fun and it seems to be that that view's been echoed or that sentiment's been echoed by everyone else that's played it. They've said pick up the pro controller, use yeah. that or use use the Joy Cons in standard Joy Con yeah. format. Don't use the motion because it doesn't do what you want it to do and you'll die a lot the pro so, controller yeah. is a wonderful controller it's expensive it's like 70 bucks but it really is a fantastic controller talking about peripherals um robbie do you want to tell us about the the next story peripheral for the switch yeah for sure gary and i also want to say i love the way you word this too all right guys details of the upcoming chat headset for nintendo switch from hori have emerged and voice chat for the switch looks as horribly complicated as we thought it would be Basically, what's going on here is you have to plug the headset, modeled after the ones in the game Splatoon 2, into both the phone and the console via this, like, arrow-shaped peripheral. It's like this dongle. So, basically, you have your smartphone, you have your Switch, and you have your headset all plugged into the same dongle, and it's going to be hanging off your head. through. And, of course, you have to use voice chat through a smartphone app, which, okay. This is genius, man. Like, I finally get to use my my phone to do something I didn't even think it could do, communicate with other people. Like, it's oh my really God. <laughs> absolutely a stunning new achievement. Nintendo, bravo. Bravo. <laughs> bravo for not getting party chat on the Switch. You've done it again. What the Amazing. fuck is this? This is craziness, man. <laughs> Have you seen the picture, <laughs> Briar? Like, it's bad. Yeah, it's I've really it, yeah. bad. The big problem is, is that there's no, there's no sleek engineering solution around it because you need a mixer. You need a mix amp. Because yeah. you're going to have two different audio sources, which is the game audio and the party audio. I've seen a couple of people that have come up with some good ideas, which is to release a revised version of the Pro Controller, which has got the mixer built into it. So it acts as the, the sort of the work through rather than having to have a separate thing. So at Please, least you've not. Just put a headphone jack you know, on the bloody controller. There, oh my God. There is a headphone you know, jack two on headphone the jacks. One that's... Is there not one on the controller? No. There isn't. No. And is the headphone jack. When I look at the headphone jack on the top of the switch, it doesn't say if it has a. Is it a tripole or a dipole connector? Can it take an um, input for a microphone? No, it can't. No, it's not so it's just a stereo no. out. Yeah. So the way it works is that you'd have that that running into a mixer. Then yeah. the mixer would do your phone and your headphones. Uh-huh. So that the phone would be the the communication right. of the the sound, and then you'd be doing the input through the headset. And you know what? It gets worse too, guys, because imagine this, right? Tell me, like Robbie. We, Tell me, how does it get worse? <laughs> here's how it gets worse. So first of all, you already have, you know, the switch plugged into the adapter. Then you have yeah. the headset on your head plugged into the same adapter. Then you have your smartphone plugged also into the same adapter oh, yeah. hanging off you. The worst part is, what if you have an iPhone 7 and it doesn't have a headphone jack? You have to use the lightning adapter, Boosh. which has an extra <laughs> extension. Plug that into the jack, and then that goes out too. The freaking phone! Like it's nuts. You're there's so many cables hanging off you. It is ridiculous. <laughs> the, the the supreme irony of all of this is that Reggie Filzame, you know, boss of Nintendo America, said that the reason they're not having voice chat as standard in the Switch console is that they don't want you to carry around some sort of bulky gamer headset when you travel. It's a portable console, and this is their solution. <laughs> it's like four cables yeah. hanging off your head. Yeah. Not count as a bulky headset. Like. <laughs> 
It's ridiculous. I, there's there's oh. a video. There's a comedy video in here somewhere where you just kind of you you start with the title how to like set up voice chat on a switch. And it's like a 10 minute video of you just plugging cables into other cables <laughs> and just like making this like snake yeah. of cables that just kind of goes on forever. <laughs> just keeps somewhere going. in here. <laughs> yeah, like and then it's all the magician off the pulling, the, pulling the handkerchief out of his sleeve forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it, there, there'll be, this is a V1, there'll be improvements on it and iterations, but. It is a difficult engineering problem to solve that they've created. Yeah, the worst themselves. part is having all these friggin' cables hanging off the same headset too, and it's all. Well, in all right honesty, there. I mean, if you've ever had a set of Astros, it's not far off from where you are there. You know, yeah. Especially in the Xbox 360 days, like you had a you had a you had a wire going to your console to your controller, then a, another wire going up to your head, and was it? I think there was a mix yeah. amp involved somehow. There was a lot of wires in the Astros. Like setting up the Astros in the 360 era, I think it's reduced now. But even with the Xbox One, I felt like there was a lot of wires going on. Yeah, I mean, it's just we'll adding the phone into the mix. <laughs> it's just like, well, why don't I, I just, just eliminate the switch and just use the phone? <laughs> <laughs> like, why do yeah, I really was... need this? It doesn't really <sighs> make, like. Why can't I just put my phone headset on? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Just for fucking voice chat, too. Like, just all these cables. It's ridiculous. All right. Next up. All right. YouTube reveals its new advertiser-friendly guidelines for videos being posted. The new guidelines, according to YouTube Vice President Ariel Barden, take a tougher stance on hateful content, inappropriate use of family entertainment characters, and incendiary or demeaning content. That's it, Briar. You're going to be YouTube rich now. All the ad revenue. <laughs> oh, boy. It's coming. Yo, I'm really happy that YouTube finally like said something about this, right? Because it's been going on for so long, and they've been so fucking quiet about it. And like it, it just leaves it leaves YouTube content creators just like in this like limbo state. <clears throat> so at least YouTube is talking about it. Um, it. If you guys don't know, anybody who's watching... Anybody who's been making YouTube videos for a while has been really on the watching YouTube basically create its own little trash can fire, right? There's like it's still yeah. its own dumpster fire because yeah, there's and it's not all YouTube's fault. A lot of it's been like the Wall Street Journal putting out video or putting out articles that are just frankly false, like and just bad journalism. Um, but also like YouTube not. Cr YouTube not communi communicating with its content creators and just letting them f like flap in the wind, not knowing what the fuck is going on. So it is nice that YouTube is finally talking to us, but they got a long way to go. Does shooting your friend in the legs on PUBG count as hateful content? Yes. Uh, I mean, did he have a scope? <laughs> I think it was <laughs> scope. <laughs> never forget oh. biznet never forget biznet biznet the poor guy he's like he probably had no idea too <laughs> and then prior just shut him down it's like scopes for everybody yeah. 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 I mean, yeah i mean seriously as a youtube creator bro that must be just a good thing like you say that youtube are trying to at least reach out and tell you guys what to avoid if you want to keep your videos monetized yeah, I mean know, it's not it's not the most elegant solution because it's come two months, three months it, after the event. But right, yeah, that's the thing, man. It's it's really been an angering thing lately. But at least if they're gonna like put rules like this into place, fine. But you got to be clear and you got to be concise and you got to be consistent about it. And then you got to also communicate about it. And uh, they haven't done any of those things. So communication is the biggest. Thing. Nice to see yeah. them at least addressing it. Um, there's other problems still, but we'll see. We'll see how they do yeah. in the future. Uh, I mean, I feel like Twitch is like sending out emails like, "Hey, we got this new feature coming out. We got this new feature coming out. It's fucking awesome over here." Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, Briar, you know, that visual. That. I mean, Twitch are doing some Yikes. some great things. I mean, we we mentioned it. I'm not going to go into it as a full article, but Briar, did you see the uh, the stock stream that Twitch were doing this week? No. What are they doing? 
crazy shit just shows how diverse and interesting is, the platform yeah, is. Yeah. It was a good, I'm not going to go into the full article on it, but um, a guy created an algorithm that reinvests $50,000 of his own money on Twitch, on, on, oh, on the stock market. I heard about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and then he would invest in stocks based on what chat voted. So chat would vote for which stock they want to put the money in. Um, every hour they'd have a new chance to, to change what the stock was divested into. Um, so vote yes for this, vote no for that. Um, and the guy's like $16,000 up um, <laughs> after, I think it's only been on there for like a week. They've been leading them right. Yeah, They've been leading him right. And he's had 307,000 viewers come through the stream in the week. Um, he's made $16,000. So what it does is at the end of the night, whatever money he's up, it just sweeps off and puts in a pot and keeps the $50,000 there. Um, and the idea is to keep this rolling and keep it going. It's called Stockstream, and it's open while the U.S. markets, but you can watch it from when U.S. markets open to close. And it's just interesting to see that it's not so much the news itself that I wanted to cover, but the fact that Twitch is so innovative and groundbreaking that it would allow something like that to happen and that people um, are supporting and getting behind it. You yeah, know, it's just an, that's crazy. It's, it's like an example of when they had Catstream or Dogstream that you just go on, you know, and people have yeah. watched that for an hour. Um, but yeah, like you said, the platform is really fresh and, and innovative. Yeah. I really like some of the features they're adding to, like the game, the developers have recognized how important Twitch, uh, like Twitch popularity is to the success of their game, especially long tail. So they've been adding features into the games that, that hook into Twitch and vice versa. So like, as we move forward, you know, you're, you're going to be able to type commands into Twitch that tells you, you know, what level a character is, like what level the streamer is, what inventory he's got. You can actually make decisions. Like you can have chat make decisions in your game that affect your game. Like stuff like yeah. that is really interesting moving forward. And since it's all happening live, you know, this can happen in real time. It's going to be a lot of fun, like as this stuff develops and comes out because developers are on board. They like what Twitch is doing. Twitch obviously is... Uh, a huge it's just feels like it's running away right now it's like on that in three years everybody will say it's a it was a runaway success but right now it yeah. just feels like it's it's sprinting right now <laughs> it's just fun I mean, to be you, in twitch right now do you think we're going to see and there's something that i've thought about with developers working it do you think we're going to see indies collaborate with twitch to create a game that's specifically designed to integrate the twitch experience so you in chat can create the experience that the streamer has through either you know paying bits to influence what happens in the game or whether it's voting free and stuff so i could see it in like mm. an open world survival game where you can like spawn in enemies or you can yeah. do things like that you know to, that would be to, dope that would be really fun because like if your stream you know obviously a lot yeah. of times the stream wants to see like bad things happen to the streamer because it creates yeah. funny funny experiences right not that they have like malice toward the streamer they just want to see like that reaction and like the bad stuff happen and see the re reaction but then also you know, like if it's really looking like a dire situation, they want the stream to continue. They want that playthrough to continue. They can like spawn in a health kit or, you know, like, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, like uh, who is that guy that spawned in Fallout that would just like randomly show up, kill a guy, and then he was out. It was like a perk in Fallout 4 and 3. Uh, the Stranger's Rifle. I can't remember what it was, but. Yeah. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 Anyhow, um... so. Don't remember. Yeah, it'd be cool if like chat could just like say, okay, you know, you need a helping hand right now. We're here for you, and then that would like help you bond with your chat even more, right? Yeah, that'd be cool. That's a really I'd great idea, Gary. Yeah, built from the ground up. I was just wondering whether or not we we saw that coming, but part of that idea until it happens, or if Twitch are watching, then there you go. It's a freebie. From yeah, basically. Yeah, if nobody's months. working on that, get working on it because that's that is a million dollar idea right there. Oh yeah. Next. What's dark? next? All right. Middle Earth Shadow of War, the sequel to 2014's Shadow of Mordor, has been delayed to October 10th, developer Oof. Monolith Productions has announced. Quote, <laughs> as with Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, Monolith is committed to delivering the highest quality experience. In order to do this, we have made the difficult decision to move our launch date to ensure that Shadow of War will deliver on that promise. I bet that was a difficult decision, moving that right into the fucking... The, the fall season of like the main release season it was it was supposed to be a summer release right august oh, i believe it was oh, yeah. oh man that thing yeah. could have made hay in august but it's gonna they have a rough a good time in october day. they really did yeah yeah i mean so it's not really a crowd pleaser game is it as well i mean the first one was more of a sleeper hit this one if they release in october i think it's, it's gonna have the, the curse of titanfall too 
Doesn't yeah. matter what the reviews are, that is not going to sell. Yeah, that first one, I feel like it was a good game, and it had some really cool ideas, but it also benef- benefited from being one of the early games on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, right when those consoles kind of came out, and there wasn't a whole lot available, right? Like, True. It yeah. benefited from that, I think. And now, yeah. like, it's it's releasing into a 2017 world. <laughs> you know, like that, yeah. it is rough out there for this game right now, and... I think August would have been perfect because that's like before all the big games come out. It's going to get buried in October, I bet. And it had a crap ton of DLC bundle season passy versions. Like I think there's one that you could get that was like, what, like $150, $140 or something just for content. Jesus, yeah. So, the other thing too yeah. about the whole you know fall release storm that's always crazy is we have E3 in a week too. We're going to find out... a ton of games i'm sure that are coming out in october november all over the place and so it's going to get even more crowded i'm sure after e3 oh, for so sure. even then seeing what it looks like and seeing how uh shadow war will stack up very interesting i'd push it to next year at this point if i were them yeah i mean the they might have e3 yeah yeah, yeah. Polish the shit out of it find a nice lonesome release date in the middle of 2018 <laughs> Yeah, winter 2018 and dominate for a week or two. Yeah, maybe. All right. Take two have claimed that they feel as a business they are under monetizing their users for microtransactions. CEO Strauss Zelnick said that Take Two wasn't maximizing its microtransaction business. Quote: We are convinced that we are probably, from an industry view, under monetizing on a per user basis. There is wood to chop because I think we can do more. One hell of an investor call there, isn't there? Going into Red Dead. You have to Very pay per bullet to load your yeah. revolver. <laughs> I think it takes balls for a company to admit to that they don't feel like they're doing enough on microtransactions and want to do more. Very interesting to hear that. What do you think, Brian? I know you've got a, a bit of a controversial view with microtransactions. I think I, you I don't really you're, mind you're all for That's them, right. aren't you? Yeah, I mean yeah. I, I see the that games cost the same they did twenty years ago. Right, is it costs sixty dollars to buy a game, just like it did for the PS2. I think the PS1 might have been fifty dollars, but so it's gone up ten dollars yeah. since the PS1. Um, but the budget for making these games has go- skyrocketed, so the difference yeah. has got to come somewhere. And gamers have proven they're unwilling to pay more than sixty dollars for a title when it's new. So guess what? You know, we got to. You gotta pay for them somehow, and they're a businessman. They're here to make money, and I think there's a right and a wrong way to do it. For sure, Robbie, I completely agree. As long as you, as long as you do it the right way, I really have no problem. If you got, you know, if you want a new outfit, you know, for your Red Dead Redemption character, awesome, awesome. I don't care. If you want, you know, DLC later down the line, awesome. I, I love it. Just don't, you know, don't cut the story halfway through and then say to be continued in the DLC, you know? Yeah, and hey, man, I want a hot pink cowboy outfit for, for Red Dead Redemption 2, so let me buy it for a couple bucks, Bob, right? Man, Robbie? Yeah, I have no cowboy. issue with that. That's, that's good. Right. Swimsuit edition. Yeah, I mean, do you not think it, it kind of cheapens a game when you have too many microtransactions in it, even if they're cosmetic? I, I don't know, maybe it's an old-fashioned mentality that I've got, but when I see a game... And the bundles on the PSN store are like there's there's fifty bundles and I can yeah, get like you know like show people I'll say gold that. revolver, yeah. pink revolver, fluffy unicorn revolver, like all this kind of shit there. <laughs> I don't know, it just it for me it changes the perception of, of how I feel like a developer's approaching a game. I hear you. I could I could see your viewpoint. Um and I'm not so sure that I don't even agree with it. But if I love a game, um and they're doing DLC the right way, like if PUBG said you know, tomorrow we're gonna start doing. Uh, can you buy those boxes on Steam? I don't even know. No, no. The PUBG I don't boxes. Believe so. I think they. I think they've got the the process working, but I don't think they're charging for it in early access. All right. So if they, you know, if they started charging for it tomorrow, I'd probably buy a dozen of those boxes because I just wanted to be able to kit my character out a little bit. And I, yeah. I, you know, I don't mind. I don't mind supporting a developer that I believe in and has been providing hours and hours of a good time. And like when it comes to games like Destiny, where I'll put a thousand, two thousand, or more hours into, and I paid sixty dollars for the game, I got like yeah. literally no issue doing Especially. cosmetic stuff. Like absolutely no issue. But as soon as you add one weapon <laughs> as, yeah, a, a as a purchasable item, 
then I'm going to be like, yo, wait, what the fuck are you doing? Because. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that maybe it's is... a different in perception, but for me, and, and I know that, that what you're saying is the safest possible option because cosmetic purchases don't segment a player base. But for me, I want something substantive for my money. So if I'm paying, you know, for PUBG, let's take that. If the new maps came out and each map cost $10 to get yeah. the map. De mm. you know no thought purchase instantly i'd buy them if you give me 10 maps at ten dollars i'd buy all 10 yeah uh, because i feel like you get a lot of mileage out of that and you work through if it was ten dollars and you gave me 10 loot crates that i can wear like you know uh, a mink fur coat you know that that for me is just i don't see any value in that purchase and i understand that i don't have to see it and that's right. my viewpoint there but yeah i'd like to see developers invest more in Micro microtransactions where I feel like I'm getting game content, playable game content, rather mm -hmm. than cosmetic content. I feel like value is such an important keyword with this too, because I think it even starts in just the base game itself, right? Like you have to make people feel like they spent money well and you gave them the value for it. And then here, if you want this option to you know, spend more money on these things, then we have it here for you. You have to make your customers feel like they're valued though. You can't nickel and dime them. There's a balance to all of it. Yeah, value is... It is a tough sell. Any as soon as you introduce value into a conversation, it's so subjective to whoever you're talking to. Different people earn, you know, they have different incomes. They they have different they have a different uh, a different definition of what value is for each individual thing you're talking about. So it's very difficult to create a value situation that's good for everybody. So what you do is you yeah. make multiple levels so that you know. And as long as there's no content that's locked behind or weapons that are locked behind, then you're good. You're good. Just make it all cosmetic and you can do DLC later. Totally. Okay, what's next? All right. A gold-colored PS4 Slim and controller have leaked ahead of its announcement. Previously, were only available in gold via a Taco Bell promotion. I remember that from when the console first came out. The console will supposedly be released on June 9th, which is less than a week from today. And what's really Gary interesting... This. Is Gary buying this? Well, Gary's buying this. One, yes, I, he is. I, I think... <laughs> Rumors have yet to be confirmed whether or not this console was designed by Little John and the Three Six Mafia because <laughs> it's kind of a, a gold blinging console. I just need grills on the front and it just says yeah, yeah every time you put the disc in. But <laughs> it's, extra it would, for that. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want that. Yeah, throwback to Usher there. Um, what's really interesting about that, on a serious note, is that the price at Walmart. And Walmart's not the type of people to do radical discounts. You know, they're going to charge you forty dollars for a PS2 game if they can. Yeah. The the hard drive was one terabyte, and it was a two hundred and forty nine dollar price tag, which is fifty dollars cheaper than the current standard price for a one terabyte system. Mm. Do we think this is an E3 discount to contest the score? That'd be awesome. That'd be great. It's good. I hope so. Yeah, I think they're pr they're more than they'll probably announce it at E3. If not, it'll be like a press release because. I don't know if it's coming out on June 9th. That's just so quick. It must be a press release if that's the case. Or it just is kind of out and they don't announce it. I think it's going to go into E3 with it. So it's not going to be, you know, you wouldn't, your E3 mic drop wouldn't be, hey, we're taking $50 and releasing the little John edition. PS4. Of the PS4. Boom. Yeah. You know, this is more, you get that out the day before Microsoft do their presentation. So Microsoft go out and go, $500 system. And then you go, well, PS4 is one terabyte, yeah, 249. Like Xbox Scorpio, like, yeah. right now it's so and powerful. You get it, all these terabytes. gold, flops, motherfuckers. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's like, we got a gold PS4 Slim. Suck on that. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> so gold, you skeet. I don't know. Is that what the kids are saying? Absolutely, Gary. So what? Nailed it. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Uh, I can't I can't even picture having a gold PS3 <laughs> or PS4 in my room. <laughs> It'd just be like weird looking. <laughs> Do you know what the controller's been out for almost a year? The the gold controller. So yeah. you know, there's there's been some poor bastard there with a the set of gold controllers just looking at his PS4, thinking, "Why don't you bling, bitch? Why don't you bling?" <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Gold. All right, Bayonetta three is apparently in discussion at Platinum Games. Platinum producer at at Sushi. Anapa, sorry, that's really hard, said, quote, I would like to make a Bayonetta 3. We're talking about it within the company even now about what to do. 
But because we're constantly talking about it, that actually makes it really hard to say. Hmm. So this was one to get beastly excited. Uh, I know oh, he's yeah. a Bayonetta fan. <laughs> um, do we think Bayonetta three is is something that would, you know, be worthwhile? Bayonetta two had a lukewarm reaction because it was a Wii U game, and like yeah. about three three people had a Wii U at that point. Yeah, I think it was, it was well problem, reviewed. Right? I think it was a great game. It just came out on the wrong platform, right? Yeah, if there is a Bayonetta three, hundred percent guarantee you it will be on everything. Like no doubt, they won't do that again. Is there any way that game could come out on PC like Bayonetta did? Bayonetta 2, maybe. Um, I mean, Bayonetta 1 was remastered for it. There's been no talk of yeah. 2. But then if 3 comes out multi-plat, then you know, maybe they're bundled 2 into it. I don't know. I feel like with PC remasters, it makes more sense to give it a year or so, or six months at least, to space them out between. So you can just make the most money. Like Darksiders, when they did the remaster for PC, they sort of really dragged that out and spaced it out. So, right. yeah, I mean, if 2 is coming to PC, I reckon we won't see it until maybe january february next year uh, was it i think this is like beastly's like favorite game of the year yeah if he's still in chat i'm sure he'd attest to it he did say that it was like the yeah, game 2014 was, he did say it was his game of the year yeah which i believe you know near automata which is similar combat there that was one of my games of this year so i could completely buy that all right what's next all right, in the latest development report from Shenmue 3 developer Usenet, the studio revealed that the game won't be appearing at E3 2017. Uh, not too surprised by this because it they just started development. Remember when it was announced two years ago and like they just announced the Kickstarter? So, I, yeah. You see, this, I this bugs me. This one really bugs me. And the reason it bugs me is that Shenmue is not an indie title. You know, Shenmue 1 and 2 were, were was it Dreamcast games? Was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sony knew they had a franchise behind them. It's not something where you know you're an indie. The fact they requested a two million dollar Kickstarter, and then once they had the two million, Sony put their own development house behind it. One triggered me, and two, the fact it, it was two years two years ago this was announced. Was that right, Robbie? The, yeah. the, the Kickstarter was two years ago. Yeah, E3 2015. But, Yep. The fact that they've given us, I believe, a, a small character animation video and said, we're going to be busy in June, sorry, we're not going to show you any more content, I think it's a bit of a slap to the face of the people that spent $2 million funding it two years ago, that they're not seeing any progress on this. But, my own view. Yeah, it'd be bad if I put money in that Kickstarter. Anybody yeah, got anything else to say about this? I actually could care less. No, no, it, it was just more... It tri it was just more a personal trigger, and I think it yeah. leads on to the BC Roundtable you. event later about you know, announcing a game, taking money for a game, and then doing nothing with a game. Oh, did we lose Robbie? We did. I'll um, hit the next article up then while he's gone. Destiny 2 is Bungie's sole focus at this time, and no more updates are planned for Destiny 1. Um, released this week what? in the announcement from Deej. Bungie has no plans to introduce further balance updates to the original Destiny, and the okay. studio has shifted its entire focus to the upcoming sequel. What do we think of this, Brian? Very excited about this. Uh, I kind of do this already from the language they've used. Uh, the, the language Activision... At one point, Activision had an investor's call and said, like, you know, there's another update coming, uh, and then had to clarify there are no more updates coming. So, like, this writing has been on the wall for Destiny 1. Um, so I was prepared for this. I knew this was coming. I want the full, you know, the full attention of Des or Bungie to be on Destiny 2 um, because that's the future. Destiny, you know, we've had it for three years. I'm ready to move on for sure. So yeah, this is actually to really exciting focused. to me. Yeah. I'm sure it's going to piss off, like, PvP players yeah. who don't like the meta right now. But this is obvious. Like, really, it is. Yeah, no. They should, the entire team, like, the whole Bungie team should be on Destiny 2 at this uh, point. Like, there's no reason for them to not be. I don't know. I think I'm going to play devil's advocate on this one and say, from a PvP player's perspective, or more so from a Destiny player's perspective, the fact that you're leaving the game in this state, this is the timeless state that Destiny 1 will be remembered in. So if you want nostalgia in two years' time, you want to come back and play Destiny 1, just to remember what it was like, this is the state of the game that you'll play. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the I don't have no a special so sticky you... ability spam. I don't really have a problem with that. There's always been some ridiculously fucked up thing about destiny pvp 
whether it was, you know, snipers yeah. like around every fucking corner, just staring at every corner you came around, or if it was shotgunners or whatever it was. You know, every period of Destiny One has had some ridiculous bullshit in PvP. And Last word in Thorn. This Mendo. is no different. <laughs> Remember <laughs> that? Me, it's a less annoying. It's a less annoying meta than we had last time with the shotgun heavy meta. Um, so I was glad they fixed that. I, I agree that the grenades are annoying, but the grenades are only getting play because the shotguns and the snipers aren't around. You know, like so it, it's it's. To me, this is a fine place to leave Destiny. I'm looking forward to Destiny 2. I'm looking forward to seeing the new stuff. I don't really... I I cannot imagine myself playing Destiny 1 much after Destiny 2 comes along, so I don't really care. Really? Totally. So yeah. you, you don't think that Bungie should leave a skeleton crew, whether or not it's... Because I think there's a myth as well that people working on Destiny 1 aren't working on Destiny 2. Uh, you know, you can't just throw resources at, at a project and get it done quicker. You know, there's no reason that they couldn't have a small skeleton crew who still work on Destiny 1 and keep it ticking along. Maybe not big content updates, but quality of life changes, balance changes. Well, obviously changes. there has to be a team monitoring the network at all times. Like, there has to be one of those teams that makes improvements to it. Like, there's small little things always going on. There has to be people monitoring Destiny 1. There's no... That's not possible. Because I just wonder whether or not there'll still be a dedicated fan base. In the same way that when Halo 3 came out, some people were still playing Halo 2 for a long time. You know, it, is it fair to, to completely cut all ties to Destiny 1 and say, this is it, this is what you play. If you want to play Destiny 1, this is your game. Yeah, I mean, it's time to move on. Really, that's just it. So. I can't agree with Robbie. I think it's just time. I mean, what are they going to do? Keep keep adjusting the meta to finally get it right? I don't think you can ever get it right. I think they, they've learned a lot from the, the development of Destiny. They, they learned a lot from putting... You know, secondary weapons in the primary slot. They learned a lot about having um, power ammo all over the map all the time. They've learned a ton. And in Destiny 2, they're going to take that knowledge. They're going to apply it. Uh, and if you want to play, you know, if you want to play an updated Destiny meta, play Destiny 2. I think that's really what, it, what it's going to be. I, I don't think there is any fix. The way they developed destiny's pvp i don't think there is any fix in it i don't think there's any way to balance it because there's just too many power weapons you know yeah they just got to move on to destiny 2 and start fresh at this point which is what they're going to do but all right our last piece of news for this week guys is that super nintendo world has been trademarked by nintendo and confirmed for orlando universal theme parks what i want to yep. go <laughs> Super Nintendo World. I love the name. I love the that name. Trademark strongly suggests that there will be at least one ride featuring Mario Kart. Whether yes! that is riding Mario Kart or yes. that's a VR or Oh you know. my god, please. I want like a um, I want a ride that's like a bounce house and it's all just huge ass mushrooms and you just go bouncing from mushroom to mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit vague as well as to how big in scope this is. The trademark is uh, quite extensive and covers a lot of different things. Whether or not this means a whole theme park or whether this is like a, a, a zone within a theme park, like Harry yeah, Potter, yeah. I think they've got in, in Universal, uh, is yet to be seen. But yeah, it's, it's official, it's happening, it's being confirmed now. So yeah, there's going to be Mario in, in Florida. So There's so many cool things they can do. And I believe also in uh, LA as well, at Universal Studios in Hollywood, there's also going to be the Nintendo theme park too. So oh, they're doing two. They're doing one on each coast. Oh my oh, god, I, I can't yeah. wait! I would definitely got to go to this man. Like I am really oh. down. Do you guys like theme yeah. parks? I like theme parks. I like. I love them. I think it's, it's a lot been of fun. years since we've been to uh, Universal Studios. We went there like five years ago now. I loved it. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> An event for Guardian Con 2018. If it's still in Tampa, there you go. You can right? go jump jump on mushrooms. Then how far away is Tampa from Orlando? I, I I never know in Florida. 40, 45 minute drive. Is it really? It's not too bad. Yeah, that's worth. <laughs> that's worth. <laughs> worth it, baby. One hundred percent worth. No, yeah. it's good. Goth can IRL stream himself jumping down a a uh, plumber's pipe. Oh, that'd be awesome if that's how you get around the park is just by like sliding <laughs> down those plumber parks. <laughs> oh, that's it. What would the concessions be like? What would they sell for food in Super Nintendo World? I think One you just eat mushrooms and grow. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, like those, you know, like those ice creams on a stick that are just shaped like one-up mushrooms, or magic mushrooms. 
Well, that's it. You could take magic, magic mushrooms, mushrooms and then <laughs> you'd feel like you're growing or shrinking. I yeah. don't know. It, yeah. When you're on shrooms, the place is really just filled with fucking LSD. <laughs> <laughs> it's just streaming with DMT. <laughs> that's what I mean. When you're on shrooms, that's you don't really point. know whether you're growing or shrinking. You don't really know. You're just kind of out of it. Yeah, they're just they're just going to have an empty warehouse with a load of shrooms at the door. You just walk <laughs> into it. You see the mushroom people. Like you're the done. fucking coloring book. Here's your Mario coloring book, and here's your LSD. <laughs> see you in a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Go wild. This should be the tagline okay. too with that. World's best theme park. <laughs> Is that it for news? That's awesome news. I can't wait to go see that. I will bring the kids too. God, you know, my I kids are at the age where they don't want to do shit with me, right? I'm like the least cool person on the planet. Oh, bro. You know? No. But I I say, hey, Super Nintendo World? Yeah. You're like, yeah, yeah. we're right down. Cool ass dad. Now you're cool that. Ass dad. Well, let's There's not plenty take that of far. mushrooms. <laughs> Yeah, let's yeah. Take here's, here's your color book. Here's your fucking mushroom. <laughs> That's it, Super Mario World. You just come downstairs with a bag of shrooms. Kids, enjoy your vacation. <laughs> Son. They're like, this is awesome. I never want to leave. It'll work. Hey. Child services are already on the way to right the house. Yeah, right Wait, who's that at the door? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they caught up with BC last week. That's the real reason he's not here. We're just, we're not <laughs> oh, God. He, he's he did the, the pilot of Super Mario World in his yard. That was it. Oh, um, my God. That's awesome. So, so, from one early announcement of Super Mario World to another, uh, do you guys want to kick off the, the roundtable for the week? Yeah, let's oh, do yeah. it. Let's do it. Why don't you introduce the topic awesome. du jour? Awesome. So, this week will be our second roundtable discussion. Um, it's not so much more of a triangular table discussion at the moment because there's only mm. three of us so mm. um yeah we're gonna we're gonna give it our best shot for a triumvirate table <laughs> so the uh <laughs> the topic for this week is when is too early to announce a game or a console does an early announcement start the hype train rolling or have gamers been burned one too many times with delays what do we think guys all right, I'm going to play it right down the middle on this one. I think it really depends on the game, the franchise. If you want to start, you know, if if you think you got something special and you want to make sure that it is in the public consciousness when it actually does come out, then you want to be talking about it. You want to be given updates. You want to get your core fans super excited so they're they're spreading the word by word of mouth. You want to be putting out some screenshots if you think you got something that's really good looking. Uh, maybe if you got if you can manage a beta or a playable demo, you want to get that out there. But you want to the goal, right? I think for most of these things is that we have something that has zero consciousness in the public, right? It has zero like hype level. By the time it comes out, we want to have it hit a crescendo, the most hype it can have right when it comes out. So it, it like everybody knows it's coming out, everybody's aware of it, and they go out and buy it. So it. Depending on the title, I think it could be that could take a long time. You know, for Shenmue, it's going to take five years. For Final Fantasy it's VII, it's going to take Final 18. Final Fantasy VII, those are still another three years out, and they yeah. were announced like three years well, ago. That's the so. other side of it, right? Is if if you release some or if you start talking about something before you even start working on it, then you might be shooting yourself in the foot because people get so sick of hearing about it that it actually turns the hype actually crescendos too early. And it starts going the other way where people are just sick about hearing about it. That's the thing, too. What I'm thinking about now, too, is, of course, there's, you know, the, like, when do you announce a game compared to when it comes out? I also think there's how much do you show it in that time frame, right? Because I think if it's a shorter window, let's say, like, six months, then I think it's okay to, you know, sort of get that hype going, show the game more. Whereas if the game ends up, you know, like two, three years on the marketing cycle, maybe don't show it as sporadically, right? Like maybe kind of take breaks and go quiet just because then people will be like, okay, we've seen way too much to this game. It's time to release it, right? So that's where for me, I'm like, I think most of the time it's better to have a shorter uh, marketing cycle just because you can build that hype more and you can really focus in and get just bombard people with news and updates on it and just show them it. You can show the game and there's no waiting for it. There's no quiet period and there's no issues with that. Like, I think it's just way safer to announce a game far into development than when it's not even started because then you get Kingdom Hearts 3, which is still three years away. So I think that works for games that are established. So things like Fallout 4, 
uh, which was announced a few months before release, I believe. That obviously was very well. Um, and, and Destiny 2, which we heard nothing about until, what, six months before release? That they've, they've actually confirmed yeah. and shown features of it. You know, games like that, people are going to be excited about, and they're going to sell in gangbusters because they've got a franchise legacy with them. You know, people are not going to say Destiny 2, I think I'll wait and see. You know, people are going to buy it. Same with Fallout. You know, whether or not the game's good or not, it will still sell bucket loads at release. Uh, prior to reviews but if your game is a new ip do you not think it makes sense to have these three you know maybe four formative years where you get more news coverage you get early access developer diaries things that can get people introduced to the world um and start to build up that that lore and surrounding and that hype you know get people thinking oh this is a game i'm really looking forward to seeing more updates on that's a good point too yeah look at the difference between Fallout 4 and a new IP. You both announced them six months before release. Fallout 4, we're, we know what it is. It's a Fallout game. It's open world. It's got role-playing and story elements to it. New IP could be whatever, and it definitely would take longer to explain that and get that word out to people. That's that's very interesting as well. The, Just, I feel like it's a gamble, though, right? So even if you're a new IP, I think Hooded one in chat had a good had a good example of this Cuphead where... The game had a ton of hype when it was showed off at E3, what, three years ago now? Right. And then it got shown again last year. And, I mean, I feel like at this point, the hype on that game has crescendoed to the point where people are now coming down off of that game. If that game had yeah. released two years ago or a year ago, I think they would have sold, like, gangbusters. But now, like, we hear about all the problems they're having with development. They're trying to add in this, like, new mode to the game because people found out it was, like, a boss battle type of game and were right. unhappy about that. So there's a there's a point at which, you know, you, you've hyped. You, you're, you, you just you can't get any more hype. So you have to be sure that you're going to actually – you're going to actually release. You're trying to time that out, right? You want to release when the hype is at its maximum point. Mm -hmm. If you don't know when you're going to release, it's going to be a hard target to hit, right? Because, you know, if you delay yeah. your game, then you can actually, you can you flip could delay and it go, years. Yeah. yeah, and then all of a sudden, all that time you put into marketing is hurting you instead of helping you. Yeah, it's kind of the analogy you... of, of like a, a really good lap dancer. Mm. You know, they know how long the dance should be. Uh -huh. You know, if they do it too short, then you're left wanting more. You want to, you know, you're not quite had enough information you've not seen enough you've not got it there too long keep going, keep going. it's just chafing mm -hmm. you're hungry you want to see what's at the buffet you know there there's, there's hot wings uh -huh. there yeah you know yeah your wife's going to be home in 10 minutes you really should be making a move you're gonna watch the glitter <laughs> off <laughs> yeah, it's, that's it you know I've, I've kind of that's it the moment's passed the crescendo's gone you now just want this news to end and the thing to just finish yeah. um I think it's very much like that in games. You want I think the it's lap dance a... to end, Gary. I don't. What's wrong with you? Oh, like I said, there's this this chafing, oh, this soreness. It's just not 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 where you want to oh, be. Chafing. Okay, I don't know who you you've no, been with. But the, the Game of Thrones is on. coming there's, on there's... in like twenty minutes. I got to get home for yeah, that. I mean, the, the club nights are <laughs> okay, on. There's a guy. There's go. a guy sweeping the hallway, just looking at you, thinking, "Are you going to leave? What's, what's right? going on here?" <laughs> Very much yeah. that feeling, and I just think with games, there's like you say, there's that crescendo moment that you need to hit that that yeah. um, that peak release when when the game needs to to go. And I think, you know, getting back to talking about games, there, if developers wait until, I guess, all lights are green and the game's not going to delay. How many times, even this show, have we spoken about games that are going to be delayed three months, six months, twelve months? Some games get delayed on on for years on years too. Yeah. I think that if you wait until you've got a game with a firm locked down release date, then you don't get that that full start, that anti climax where it's like I was ready for this game, it just didn't release. You know, right. it kept the window keeps getting pushed back. I think maybe a hard rule that that we should look at is should a game have a release date before it gets announced? No, I don't think so because I think then you're losing out, especially on new IP IPs of like building up that crescendo, right? If you're trying to take Cuphead from zero to 60 in a month, it's just not going to happen for you. Or in six months, it's probably not going to happen for you. You know, if you get lucky and can get on the stage at an E3, that's going to really help you out. If you're not that lucky, then you've got to try and build that up from the get-go, and it's going to take longer than six months. So you're going to want to be 
you're going to be out there for a year kind of like, okay, you know, like here's the dev diaries, like you were saying, and here's, here's some early graphics and Hey, we got our sound guy. He'll, he'll he's doing an interview over an IGN and you know, that kind of thing, just trying to build just the, like the, just the overall consumer knowledge of this product that it's even a thing. You just got to try and start building that from an early point. And yeah, you don't want to get it delayed because you don't want to like fall into the point where people are sick of hearing about it, but you got to build up, you got to build up some name brand recognition for your, for your thing, especially a new IP. But I mean, showing products that are unfinished or perceived to be lacking in, in features can really damage investor sentiment as well. So you mentioned getting things out early um, to, to build some hype. If you get it out too early, then it, it just, you know, you haven't got all the features and bundled in that you expect to see in a release game. And a good example of this is the Switch um, announcement. So when the Switch was demoed in October 2016, the day that it was released, Nintendo shares dropped 7% because people were like, is this all you got? This is this is garbage. Like, what, why are we caring? You know, it's not got anything that it wants. It's not going to compete with other consoles. Then, when the Switch actually launched and, and the first month sales came in, stocks went through the roof because like people saw what the product was capable of. They saw it in the right light. You know that you had the follow up um, presentation. I think in January. So the announcement was October, and the follow up in January. Got, you know, got some goodwill into it. Do you think announcing games early, like you say, actually works against them in that you show an unfinished product? I think uh, I, I think the press is used to seeing unfinished games. So if you if you show a build off to the press and it's running at 15 frames per second, you can expect that you know it's at least the season journals. Like if you bring it to a respectable outlet, an outlet that's been around for a while, they're not going to say this game ran like poop because they're going to know that it's an early build and they've seen early builds before. They know what to expect. You, you can't release that to the public or a YouTuber because they won't know how to take that information. Um, I, I, I think it's a fine line and I think it's probably going to be different for every game because like if you're releasing Gears of War 4 then I don't know you don't really need to talk about that for two years before it comes out because everybody knows what Gears of War is uh, as soon as you start talking about it you're, you know Gears of War is going to get on the stage at E3 right you know the Xbox is going to have a you know two minute trailer highlight for you and right you're going to be able to basically start talking about that game once you know the release date but if you're a smaller developer and you're doing a new IP, it's much harder. And that, that decision is going to be, you know, like it's a, it's a risk and it's a gamble because you got to figure out how to build that hype and you want it to act, peak at the exact time of release, but we're not exactly sure when the release is going to be. So you're going to try and build like this slow groundswell and then you'll start hyping it up harder and harder and harder as you are more firm about that release date. But then yeah. all of a sudden, you know what? turns out fixing this bug is way harder or adding this feature is way harder than we thought it was going to be. The game's just not going to be finished. You know, it's going to be another three months. It's going to be another six months. And then, you know, what do we do? You know, do we try and keep the hype train going? Do we just, do we just hit the brakes on it and start again in six months or what do we do? You know, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the, the whole, announcement at E3 and showing the two minute trailers on these games and, and getting them out there. Mm -hmm. The other point I wanted us to, to kind of talk around was, was E3 announcements and winning E3 as, as some people do. I think 2015 people claim that Sony won E3 with the announcement of Final Fantasy 7 remake happening. Um, and that game's what, three years off now. So we're looking at you know a game that's just infinite. You know, do you think it's on the topic of games being released early? Do you think it's fair to give a company credence or credit for announcing that they intend to work on a game at some in, indeterminate point in the future? You know, announcing a game and saying it's coming, don't know when. Does that does that win a conference for you, or are you past that? It's hard um, to see that with like uh, with clear eyes when it's happening, right? When you're sitting in, when you're sitting there watching those announcements, and Sony does this so well, where they just like game, 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 and by the end of it, you're in like this frenzied state because you can't wait to play all of that shit they just showed you, but you in haven't yet had time to figure out. Well, well, they wait a minute. That game is not even in development yet. This game was not gameplay. It was just a CG trailer. This game, you know, like and you just, afterward in like the week following, 
you know, maybe you could figure all that stuff out. But it's very hard when you're sitting there watching those kinds of things. They're designed to get you excited. You know, like they're yeah, very yeah. specifically. It's almost like the that. release dates during the conference. That doesn't matter. You just see they show you these amazing games like Death Stranding last year and Days Gone and God of War. And it's like to, to you in the moment, it's like it doesn't even matter when this is coming. But holy shit, this looks amazing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so God of War were, last year. I mean, I didn't really give a shit when that when I heard that game was going to get announced. And then that trailer was so damn good. That yeah. I was instantly hyped for it, you know? Right. Now, I don't but, I, I mean, don't even know how long i got to wait for the game. <laughs> which is my point there about saying, do you think games need release dates um, when they're announced? Maybe that was too strong to go one way, but do you think a game should at least have a release window uh, when it's announced? You, you know, do you think that the industry should tolerate, or us as gamers and consumers should tolerate a TBD um, at the end of, of most games that we see? So if... Final Fantasy VII remake had had come out and you know been been announced and then at 2015 they'd said I don't know 2020 coming Ooh, you know maybe that no. would have tempered that expectation a little bit I'm just being real there that as consumers do you think we deserve an indication as to when we should expect to see what we're looking at not necessarily I think the one thing that's important though is just don't announce the game unless you know it's at least somewhat in development I think that's the problem for me it's not even you know, announcing a new game and not having the release date, it's more of just hopefully this game is actually in development. That's what bugs me. Like, I actually want something, you know, that they're working on, actively working on, and it's been in the works. That's the thing for me, is more than just whether there's a release date post or not. So. Yeah. That, okay, oh, well, that was a long time to respond there. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I, maybe I'm just a bit more bullish with it there, but I just think that I'm, I've I've got to a point now where I'm fed up with developers showing me things um, to try to win favor or to win sentiment out of me. You know, I think show me something that I can buy, show me something that is coming for me. Um, you know, in yeah. the in the near future. You know, t to me, you're not going to win E3 in my mind showing me a CG trailer for something that you want to develop in the future. That Kingdom Hearts 7 trailer um, at Kingdom 2015, sorry, uh, Final Fantasy 7 trailer, may okay. as well, in terms of timeframes and delivery, they may as well have announced Destiny 3 in terms of when it's going to be released. That's, that's a similar thing. Right? Yeah. Um, it's like Bungie coming out and saying Destiny 3 will happen. Oh, and then walking Yeah, out. I agree, Gary. And again, to that's me, where for me it's well, like just... Have a game that's at least far enough in development we don't have to wait forever for, and then it ends up getting pushed back a billion times, and they're like, oh, we're sorry, we have to push it back, and then it gets pushed back again, and again, and again. Just please make sure your game is a real game. That's all I want. You know? That's the big thing for me. Yeah. No, it's just affected me more than, than I guess, you two guys watching the E3 each year. I don't know. I just I feel more and more... Uh, reluctant to, to get excited about anything there because I feel like I'm just being lied to. You know, it's, it's like watching politics. I'm not getting political now, but you get to a point where every politician says the same thing and you feel like, I don't care what any of you say because I know that none of you are telling me right. the truth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all so, these guys, you know, I promise. I don't know. Maybe it comes from a wrong. difference of where uh, I, I watch E3 and it's more, inform it's more entertainment than it is information. There's certain things I'll watch specifically for information like uh you know I, I my youtube channel is pretty much devoted to destiny so i'll be watching anything that has a bungie developer on it like a hawk right uh, you know is bungie <clears throat> going to be on the stage at e3 at sony's pre press conference i'll be watching like a hawk for that but the rest of this stuff is pure entertainment i'm just looking forward to you seeing like what what cool ideas are kind of down the road in in video games and what you know what big surprises will there be any like and you can play it now moments, you know, like that kind of stuff. That's my favorite stuff at E3. Um, so hopefully, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff happens. But yeah, like if you're looking for it for like, what am I going to be playing this year? I think, yeah, you're definitely going to be disappointed. But if you're looking for it for just like ideas and hype for the for the foreseeable future, I don't know. It's a weird thing, right? It's like, what are they really selling at E3? I don't know. Just selling you on a game that will come. You know? like, That's what just... I mean. I feel like it's they're trying to court favor so that yeah. you know magazines and coverage will say this developer or this company won E3. Yeah, and then what's um, that which really is why, benefit them? Well, that, that's what I mean. It's just goodwill and sentiment for me. That's why I really like the way Nintendo have gone 
which are regular directs that aren't E3 that tell me this game is coming out. This is the release date for it. These amiibos are coming out. This is when it's happening. You know, I get I get that hype, but I get it regularly throughout the year and I get it r- relative to something that I know, you know, I can cross days off the calendar to when it's coming. Yeah. So yeah. for me, I don't know whether or not, and this would be interesting. We're not going to solve this here and now, but for the viewers um, and people in the comment section, if, if they want to give us their views, I'd, I'd love to get more people's opinions on this. Do, do people feel like, they're hearing about games too early are people jaded by that do people think like briar that that it's something that they watch for entertainment and they don't really care when it's coming out they just want to be wowed you know what what are, what are people's views on this yeah i'd like to hear that too for sure it's a it's a weird question right like i i want to i want to have the argument for each individual game because i feel like it's a different thing for each game like the marketing and the release time for Cuphead is completely different than Gears of War or Halo yeah. 5 or or Destiny 2, right? Like each thing is going to have its own its own set of you know pieces like a, pieces on the chessboard that have to be manipulated, the development time, how you know, how popular is this franchise? Is it a franchise or is it a brand new IP? Like do we need to make people aware of this? It's it's an interesting thing to think about. It'd be like how fun would it be to try and like develop like a marketing plan for like a game, you know, like, like even yeah. if you just did it theoretically, like it'd be pretty fun to do. Like, how do you, like if we were to make the beastly thoughts game and our target was to bring it out in 20, you know, 20, let's say 2020, like when do we start talking about it? Nobody's ever heard of the beastly thoughts game. So right. Do we start talking yeah. about it now while we're just like putting the ideas together or do we want to wait till, and till where Sony- would we, Picks us up market as, our game developers. as well i mean obviously banner ads on pornhub would be the first place that i'd be putting it i'm just thinking where nobody looks at would probably ads be on going. pornhub they just click right through <laughs> show me I, the they, porn thank you very much <laughs> I, I, I go there for the comment section that's what i go there for <laughs> i have it's a look for lively debate that's it, you know? that's it. Does she the even know how to 69 this is ridiculous <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's it. Best comments are things like, you know, her eyes look glazed over. She's not into this. It's like, really? <laughs> oh, you think so? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. All right. But, yeah. I think that's going to do it. Is that anything else we want to add to this conversation before we get going? No, I think we've we've kind of settled that. I think that there's no hard and fast rule. I think it yeah, varies from the game to game. In the show for the week and uh we're, as we close off, though, I think one thing we're going to make clear is that obviously next week is E3. It's going to be big for us. We're going to be – we don't know necessarily when we're going to do the show next week because basically Saturday is when it kicks off with EA. Sunday, Microsoft's conference is set to go live an hour before we do the show typically. So we're definitely going to have a discussion on that when we want to do the show, whether we're even going to do it on Sunday, which I think we probably still will. Um, but – yeah, I mean, next week we have EA, Microsoft, Bethesda, Ubisoft, Sony, Nintendo, and we'll cover it for the weeks to come. So it's going to be an exciting time, and we'll keep you updated. Just check Twitter. I'll be updating then when we're going to do the show next week, and yeah, there will be an announcement on that. So we're going to have to discuss that when we want to do it. I'm going to use this platform uh, as well for the people that have suffered through this long on YouTube or in the Twitch chat to shamelessly plug our pod. Cast. Yeah, um, sell we're, on, out. we're sellouts we're on, and we're proud. We ain't even we're ashamed. We're on Podbean, we're on iTunes, and I take great pleasure in looking each day at how many additional followers and reviews we've got. I'm a very, very small and petty man, and these things <laughs> no, make me Gary, very pleased inside. It make me pleased, you know. If, if one person's gone on there and given me a follower, then you know, I, I feel like I, you know, I don't have to kick that stray dog on the way home. I don't have to, to do that. You know, I can can take solace in in the fact that that we've got that. But the link will be posted in the the chat when we close off. The link is also on the YouTube video. So, if you've come through this far, I'll take it because, you know, you just enjoy sadomasochism, uh, and there's plenty more of that on the podcast. So if you could leave us a review, a comment, a follow, dare say it. Um, we're not promising anything, but there may be nudity in it for you from one of these hosts. It's possibility. Can't confirm. <laughs> Cannot confirm Thanks, that Brian. there may be some nudity. 
Mm. Yeah, I like watching numbers go up. It's way more satisfying than watching them go down. Don't know what it is about that, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really happy we're on on Podbean and in iTunes. Like, it's really exciting, uh, and it's exciting. I think for a lot of people who've requested that feature for a long time to uh, finally be able to have like an audio only version where you don't have to waste your battery life with a screen of our ugly mugs on it. Absolutely, it's great. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> in in terms of the numbers, before I was spending a fortune each month on Viagra, and now I just watch the follow account go up, and that has the same effect. And that gets you excited, yeah. So it's it's, it's as wonderful. good as good. Free Viagra. I know. That's awesome. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. We uh, will be back next week with a new topic du jour. We'll be talking about a lot about E3, which is going to be a lot of fun. We'll be um, right in the madness, man, right in the middle of it. That's right. It's going to be awesome. We will, of course, upload these to YouTube, to Podbean, to iTunes. So make sure you click the uh, follow button or subscribe button, wherever that is, on your favorite podcast app of choice. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day, guys. We'll see you next week for E3.